Now, I know we have at least one Irishman here. Oh, yeah, only one. Anybody, for, any, anybody else Irish? Oh, yes, three, yes, mum, and I didn't know you were Irish. Irish ancestors. Irish ancestors. Well, one day, I was in a pub in Dublin, and I went to the bar to get my pint of Guinness, right, and I was just waiting at the bar, and there was this man at the bar drinking a pint of Guinness, and he simply turned to me and he said, what's your story then? I know. I can't remember what I said, but what, a, what an opening line. What is your story? And that's what I want to talk about, the story. Um, we watched last night a 1965 film called The Greatest Story Ever Told. That's right. It has a little cameo in it with John Wayne as a centurion at the cross. And you can hardly hear what John Wayne's saying, but he just said, surely this is the man of God. That wasn't the John Wayne interpretation, but right. the greatest story ever told. And the heart that I really have is, is this, that... When I say story, it's not make-believe, right? So probably a better word, a more grown-up word, is narrative. This is about things that happened in history. And you haven't come across it. I thought it was quite clever when I first heard it. History is his story, right? It's his story. And it's a story that is good news. It's good news. It's a bank like this. Read all about it. Read all about it. Jesus is Lord. And the church and believers aren't called to, to sell newspapers, thank goodness. Right? But we're to be storytellers. Yeah. Clever, that wasn't it? Yeah. We're storytellers. We are the newspapers. Now, we all complain about you know, bad news. Right? And a lot of it is. But the story that I'm going to look at and challenge you with, because I'm going to challenge you, this isn't a story that is just some nice little story. This story is meant to be absolutely life-changing. But I want to tell you the problem that you and I have as human beings. We want to write our own story. We want to write our own story and don't want to be involved in God's story. You've heard it again and again, preachers have said, and I challenge you, it doesn't matter how nice you are or how you appear to me well-dressed. Deep at the root of every single person is the song Frank Sinatra sings, I do it my way. The tragedy today is that when most people, are, first of all, the tragedy today is that most people haven't even heard the story. Or they've heard little bits of the story. I've heard a little bit about Easter, yes? I've heard a little bit about Christmas. But they are tiny bits of a grand story that we need to know, and we as Christians need to know, 
and we need to know how to communicate because this is the truth. See, Easter and Christmas have been totally ruined by commercialism. Totally ruined. The story's missed. And what's, what the world is crying out for, what people are crying out for in the midst of doing it their own way, is hope. What is life about? What is my life about? Why am I here? What is going to happen when I die? And the prevailing narrative, the prevailing story, postmodern culture that we live in, let me tell you what it is. And let me tell you whether this gives you hope. We're here by chance. Everything's random. I can do it my way. We'll get better. That is the story, the narrative that is in the world. Yeah, absolutely. The tragedy is, and this is, this is the tragedy, most people are going around with this story and are in delusion. They think we're, Christians are deluded. This is the problem that we have. We've got to get to this place. We know the story. And the interesting thing, the challenge to us as church, and we've been looking at this, and in one sense I'm going back to the, the text and the little bit of scripture that we've been going through for weeks in Matthew 28. Yeah? I spent a whole preach on go, didn't I? Well, I, this is almost me preaching on make disciples. How do you make disciples? You tell them the story. And the interesting thing is when you go into the Bible... It's not particularly that the, the, the church are going on the street corner and saying, you need to be saved. People are coming up to the believers and, say, and asking questions. And let me just prove this to you. From Acts, the beginning of the church in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 8. When the Holy Spirit had come down on this small group of things and they were doing strange things, yes? You know the story? Pentecost, the people around said this, how can this be? How can this be? What's happening? And chapter 2, verse 15, then Peter stood up. What did he do? He told them a story. Acts 3, verse 18. Peter had just healed a beggar, yes? And the people were flabbergasted. In fact, they wanted to get Peter up and worship him. And he said, no, let me tell you a story. And he goes on about the story. Actually, and then Acts 4, Peter and John do another thing. They said, by what power or what name do you do this? What did Peter do? He told them a story. He told them the narrative. He told them what is reality. God exists. Jesus Christ is Lord. He died on the cross to defeat all demonic and evil powers and to forgive sin. And he went on. And what happened to them? They were convicted. This story is true. And it goes on. I will give you other illustrations. Acts 7, Stephen, the high priest, asked Stephen, are these charges true? And what does Stephen do? 
He told a long story. It goes on for chapters. He started from right at the beginning and goes all the way through and says, Jesus is Lord, that's why I'm doing it. And they were convicted. In fact, they were so convicted, they didn't like it because their, that story conflicted against their story and they killed him. There is a health warning, I put it in my letter. There is a health warning of telling this story. It comes right up against everything people believe today. It challenges human nature. It challenges your pride. It challenges your will. It challenges the story. I will write. You see, this is the whole context of how we live matters. If you're visiting the church, we spend a long time saying how we live absolutely matters. Shall I tell you why it matters? Because if we're living under the story, under God's rule and sovereignty and love and grace, people say, what's going on? Why do you keep going to church? Why do you keep battling through when things are difficult? I'd have given up. Let me tell you a story. That's how evangelism should be. How we live in that is not primarily how holy we can get. How we live matters is the glorious means by which people ask us questions so that we can tell them a story. By that process, God is glorified. And it's, it's not a means of us being justified. Got, the, got that? Can you see that? You see, the gospel, the good news... Is far big. The story is far bigger than I can give. You know, come to church and actually I'll give you, hold on, I've got a ticket to heaven here if you want to accept it. That drives me batty. Makes my tick. That's not the story. That's a little bit of the story. The story, and we're going to look at what this story is in a minute. The story is this. It's an invitation to become an integral part of God's plan and story and mission of restoration and reconciliation of the whole of the creation through and by Jesus Christ. Now that is worth living for. Not just a ticket which I can pull out and, you know, anywhere I pass the pearly gates. This is about life now. This is about eternal life now and the future glory. Oh, we have, we read all about it. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. So, I just want to, what is the story? What's the story? What, you know, right, Mike, how do I go about it? What's the story? When the, that man, I wish I'd been, you know, I wish I'd, I wish I'd heard this preach when I was in, before I was in Dublin. You know, and this guy said, what's your story? This is the story I would have told him. All right? I would have gone on and said something like, I am part of this story. But before I, we look at the story, I want to say two things first of all. It is God's story. That by grace... I become part of, a minute part of, but a glorious part of. It's God's story. It is his story. History is his story, working out his purposes through all the ups and downs of nations, dictators, or whatever, will come to a wonderful end, as we'll see. Secondly, and this is the good thing, it's a story that through faith in Jesus Christ, every single person on this earth can become part of. Now that is good news. 
Forgive me if I'm shouting, if I get a bit excited. Right. Where are we? So, what is the story that we must be able to tell in condensed form? And it's just, it's more than Jesus loves you. It's more than Jesus loves you. It is a narrative. It is a story. You see, this is the challenge. Either you're in this story or you're not. Either you join with God's story or you are writing your own story that has not any reference to God at all. And we'll see what the consequences of that means in a minute. But it has severe and major implications. You see, the Bible makes it clear. Do you know there are, there's a book of life? Do you know there's a book of life? That, those, that God writes names into who are written into the story. Philippians 4.3 uh, says this. Paul writing. Yes, and I ask you, my true companions, he's talking about some ladies, help these women since they have, been, have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, the good news, the story, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose name are written in the book of life. Basically saying they're in the story. Revelation 3, 5. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out their name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that their name before me, before the Father and his angels. Written into the story. Paul puts it in a different way. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2, he says, You are are a letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. That's a lovely picture, isn't it? He's basically saying, you're part of the story that people are reading. How we live matters. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3 says this, you show that you are a letter from Christ. Isn't that amazing? to be part of this story. So, what is the story? It's a very simple story, right? Quite a long story. It's basically all in the Bible. But I think the best way to think of it is this. Think of it as four chapters. Four parts of a story that we become part of and we need to be able to tell. The first chapter is this, and these are all so important, right? It is, it starts with creation. Unless we get this foundationally clear in our thinking, all the other things fall apart. It's crucial to understand everything else that follows. And the Bible's good, isn't it? It's like every good storybook. Once upon a time, or in the beginning, remember, it's not a fairy story. This is history. The Bible starts off, in the beginning. It starts with God, the eternal God who exists in perfect unity and completeness. There's the first thing. There is a God. The prevailing narrative of this generation is that there is no God. Everything was by chance. The call for us as the church is to stand up and to hit that culture and say, you're mad. What you believe does not make any sense whatsoever. It doesn't. This is the delusion, you know, Dawkins wrote the God delusion, didn't he? This is the atheist delusion. And we've got to be able to stand up and, and for, there is a God. 
Where did all this come from? Look at the plain signs of it in creation. In that every heart of every man on earth is crying out for something beyond them, something transcendental, something you know, beyond them. Look at the evidence. I can't prove to you, but the evidence is rational. He created the cosmos for his own pleasure and glory. And the most wonderful, wonderful thing is this. God created mankind to be his co-worker. Now just think about it. God of the universe created you to be a co-worker. The Bible calls it an image bearer. to rule and reign and to steward the world. Makes sense of everything. And in this relationship that God, when he made mankind, he made mankind never to be autonomous. He did not create us to be on our own. What does it say, the Bible says? It is not good for man to be alone. So what, there are two levels. One, we were never, ever meant to live without a relationship with God. We were never meant to write our own story. And we were always meant to be in relationship with one another. That is foundational. That's the story we tell. Yes? And someone comes, you, you can't not believe in illusion. Of course I don't. You know, God created, we're not here by chance. We're not here by chance. God created us. You know, you know Stu knows this, he revels in it. But this is, the, this is the thing, this is where God's rising us up now at this time. Tell the story. Confront the powers and the culture. It pervades the world. We hit it. Yes? And as we hit it, it's not our eloquence that will change people's minds. God will take the story that we tell by the Spirit of God and convict people. So it works. So that's the first part. That's chapter 1. Well, just before I go on to chapter 2. God created us to love God. God created us to love each other. God created us to love ourselves. And God created us to love his creation. That's how he's created us. Chapter 2, the fall. Toy Tolstoy. Is that right? It is right. Yeah. Wrote the following. There is a God that people generally believe in. A God who must serve them. You hearing what I'm saying? It's all about me. That's fundamental to the human condition. It's all about me. I am the most important person in the universe. And from that delusion, multitude of sins and depravities flow from. So he said, most people believe in a God a God who must serve them. Sometimes it's very re in re very refined ways, say, by merely giving them peace of mind. This God does not exist, says Tolstoy. But the God whom people forget, the God whom 
all must serve exists and is the prime cause of existence and of all that we perceive. Good, doesn't it? We want to be God and write our own story. Now, if you don't think that's true about you, I'm going to tell you, if you're outside, it, it is. Human beings are basically selfish, self-centered, and when you get to that state, God goes out the window. Because God says, I created you and you're meant to serve me and be submissive to me. Someone who wrote about the history of the Al Alcoholics Anonymous titled his book, Not God, because he said that stands as the most important hurdle an addicted person must surmount to acknowledge deep in the soul not being God. No mastery of manipulation and control at which alcoholics excel can overcome the root problem. Rather, the alcoholic must recognize individual helplessness and fall back into the arms of a higher power. First of all, we had to quit playing God, concluded the founders of the AA, and allow God himself to play God in the addict's life which involves daily, even moment-by-moment moment surrender. You see, that's why it's so hard to become a Christian. I don't want to let go of control. I surely don't want to do the things God says because they appear to me to... Oh, what do they appear to me? They appear to be... Oh, so constraining to be a Christian, isn't it? Oh, how can you do... Oh, it, it's, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. That's the delusion. The delusion is, if I give over control, it's going to harm me. My rights are going to be infringed. Can you see that? That's the fall. Whereas it is totally the opposite. It is totally the opposite. To lose your life is to gain it. But that's an anathema to the fallen nature. An anathema. That's what the fall is. Biblically, to be lost is to be self-obsessed. Ever thought of it like that? To be lost is to be self-obsessed. And the implications of this, well, the fall leads to this. Remember those four things I said? It leads to the things God designed us for. The relationship with God is broken. Relationships with others are broken. Relationship with ourselves are broken. And relationship with the created order are broken. That is the severity of the fall. And unless, when we bring people to Christ and ourselves, see our heart outside of Christ, as awful as that, then we're going to struggle in the Christian life. Chapter 2, that was. Chapter 3, we get to the redemption the buying back, God's plan of getting us back into line with him. Easter, 
the cross. What Jesus did when he was on the cross, all this evil, all this sin that is in us and outside of us, he became the magnet of magnets. And he drew it all upon himself. Everything upon himself. And it was judged. And he paid the penalty of our wrongdoing. That's what happened when he died on the cross. He disarmed the evil powers. There are evil powers, folks. Did you know that? That take opportunity of human, hum, humanity's self-will. They become little gods where we find security in. Money. Sex, power, and a multitude of other things. That's how it works. You see, we know why the world is like it is. Do you know that? We know why it's like this. Because individuals have said, my way. I am the most important. Let me read what Edith Schaefer said. It's, it's a good analogy. It's quite penetrating and powerful. The philosophy of living with an underlying motive of doing everything one's own for one's own personal peace and comfort, comfort rapidly colours everything that might formerly have come under the headings of right and wrong. Can I say that again? And you think of the world as it is now. The philosophy of living with an underlying motive of doing everything for one's own personal peace and comfort rapidly colours everything that might formerly have come to the headings right and wrong. I'm not going to read the rest because it's a bit too challenging, I think. But Jesus came in and paid the price so that we might be reconciled to God. When we accept Jesus, repent, and accept the Father's forgiveness, we are restored to that relationship which we were originally intended to. That's what salvation brings. Redemption also brings relationship with God and with others. Alongside healing our relationships with God, Jesus redefines our relationship with others. In the natural course of things, we see others in terms of our fallen nature, as our competitors, as beneath us, as enemies. At the cross, this flips on its head and is totally redefined. Redemption also brings us back into relationship with ourself. Because, I preached this some other time ago, you see, God does not want us to go to the repair shop. He doesn't want us to be, you know, to be made a little bit newer or better, Right? The problem is, says, look, you want to become a Christian? You've got to die. There ain't any repairing of this. You know, I don't suddenly get a little bit better. I don't suddenly become a little bit less selfish, although I strive to, yeah? There's that root within the fallen nature where Jesus says, unless you repent, unless you turn around and say, I'm going in a totally different direction, you die. That's why conviction by the Spirit is so important. This is only God can, only God by His Spirit can open up our eyes to see who we're really like. 
and who wonderful Jesus is. And then the fourth thing that redemption does, Jesus does on the cross and resurrection, he brings us back into a relationship with the created order. Making disciples of the nations is our first role in the mission of God. Bringing people to Christ and restoring humanity to God as image bearers. Wonderful. Chapter 3. And then the final part of the story is this. Restoration. The hope that we have that one day, maybe soon, that Jesus Christ will return. Jesus Christ returning, right? Not as a baby, not as a, a human where he divested himself of all his divine glory. No. He's coming back as God. In his full, he, he'll divest himself of, of, well, he'll put on. I've got the words. This man, Jesus, and he will be a man, man God, in his total glory to judge the heavens and the earth and get, make everything right. And ask every single person the very simple question. Are you in the story? Are you in the story? Do you know you're in the story this morning? Do you know you're in the story? Only you can answer that. Are you assured you know that you've given your life to Jesus Christ. You've humbled yourself and said, forgive me, I repent. Are you in the story? And that story is so glorious and so full of hope that it's not a ticket to heaven. It's not a ticket to heaven. It is becoming part of God's restoration for the cosmos now. The disciples said to Jesus, when will the kingdom come? It's now. It's in every believer's heart. The kingdom of God is now. So I end with this simple thing. Are you in the story? I don't know, most of you could say, yes, I am, I'm in the story. But be sure you're in the story. For those that are in the story, make sure you know how to just say it. You know, those four chapters. Because the days are coming and, and are now here where we will need to confront the culture and the narratives that abound in schools, in universities, in our friends' thinking, because people just imbibe it. They just imbibe it. Okay? I'm going to sing now our. Oh, yeah, we'll come, come up in a minute, Jen. Yeah, go on. Finish my preach off. Yeah, go on. Um, this is a response of a prayer, and it's at the end of the uh, what Mike posted um, on the, the news chat. But it's just summing up what you've been sharing. Father God, thank you for your beautiful story, which brings all together, all things together again, through the death and resurrection of your son Jesus. I repent of the ways I have lived in brokenness, and I look with delight to see what you're doing in the world around me. Thank you for your hope, the hope you give us that, is bro that this broken world will one day be healed. Help me to move alongside you in your mission as you restore the earth. 
Teach me how to thrive as a person, the person that you've made me to be. Allow me to live with my eyes and my heart open to hear your voice and participate in the building of your kingdom. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to conclude my preach by singing the whole of Blessed Assurance. This is my story. So if we could have the musicians up, that'd be great. <laughs>